Good afternoon. Okay, I will uh, beg your indulgence at the top. We have a few items uh, to get through, and by a few, I mean slightly more than a few. Um, uh, first, starting today, foreign national air travelers to the United States will be required, with only limited exceptions, to be fully vaccinated and to provide proof of vaccination status prior to boarding an airplane to the United States. The new international air travel policy is stringent, it is consistent across the globe, and it is guided by public health. This new global travel system replaces the existing country by country restrictions, putting in place a consistent approach worldwide. There is no need as of today for foreign national travelers who have been in one of the 33 countries with restrictions to obtain national interest exceptions in order to travel to the United States. When it comes to testing, fully vaccinated air travelers age two and over continue to be required to show proof of vaccination and documentation of a negative COVID test, viral COVID test, taken within three days of the flight's departure to the United States before, before boarding. That includes all travelers, U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, and foreign nationals alike. To further strengthen protections, unvaccinated travelers, whether they are U.S. citizens, whether they're LPRs, or the small number of accepted unvaccinated foreign nationals, now need to show documentation of a negative COVID, uh, viral COVID test taken within one day of the flight's departure to the United States. Again, this goes into uh, effect uh, today, and we know there is um, uh, a welcome for it around the world. Uh, next, today, the Department of State, through the Transnational Organized Crime Rewards Program, announced a reward offer of up to $10 million for information leading to the identification or location of any individual or individuals who hold key leadership positions in the Soden Okobi uh, and Reville uh, ransomware variant Transnational Organized Crime Group. The department is also offering a reward of up to $5 million for information leading to the arrest and or the conviction of any individual conspiring to participate uh, in or attempting to participate in a Soden Okobi Reville ransomware incident. Since its first known ransomware incident in April of 2019, this group has allegedly victimized more than 1,000 entities in multiple industry sectors. That includes in private businesses, law enforcement agencies, government agencies, and educational and medical institutions. This announcement, announcement complements today's coordinated counter, -ransom, uh, counter ransomware ac actions from the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of the Treasury. The United States remains committed to protecting all ransomware victims around the world from the exploitation of cyber criminals. And we look to nations who harbor ransomware criminals to bring to justice uh, for businesses and organizations victimized by ransomware incidents. Next, we are concerned with disturbing uh, images and reports uh, emanating from the Belarus-Poland border this weekend. The United States strongly condemns the Lukashenko regime's political exploitation and coercion of vulnerable people and the regime's callous and inhumane facilitation of irregular migration flows across its borders. We call on the regime to immediately halt its campaign of orchestrating and coercing irregular migrant flows across its borders into Europe. As long as the regime in Belarus refuses to respect its international obligations and commitments, undermines the peace and security of Europe, and continues to repress and abuse people seeking nothing more than to live in freedom, we will continue to pressure Lukashenko and will not lessen our calls for accountability. The United States will continue to stand by Poland and all of our partners in Europe who have been threatened by Belarus's, Belarus's unacceptable actions. Next, today marks the one-year anniversary since Burma held elections. Uh, we previously noted from independent observers that the November 8th elections last year, despite some concerns, were credible and reaffirmed the commitment of the Burmese people to democracy. The military's coup on February 1st of this year and ongoing violent crackdown, however, have undermined human rights and fundamental freedoms, suppressed the will of the people, and reversed a decade of progress towards a genuine democracy that the people of Burma clearly demand. Today, I join the Secretary in honoring the people of Burma who strive to restore the path to democracy, respect for human rights, 
and the rule of law in their country, including the more than 1,300 innocent people who have lost their lives in that struggle. The United States is committed to promoting justice and accountability for these and other abuses. We also reiterate our call for the military regime to immediately cease violence, release all those unjustly detained, and return Burma's path to a genuine and inclusive democracy. Next, the United States is deeply concerned about the deteriorating health of PRC citizen journalist Ms. Zhang Zhang. According to multiple reports citing her relative's comments, Ms. Zhang is near death. In December of 2020, Beijing authorities sentenced Ms. Zhang to four years in prison on charges associated with her journalism on COVID-19 in Wuhan. The United States, along with other diplomatic missions, uh, we have repeatedly expressed our serious concerns about the arbitrary nature of her detention and her mistreatment during it. We reiterate our call to the PRC for her immediate and unconditional release and for Beijing to respect the free press and the right of people to express themselves freely. Uh, today, Secretary Blinken met with Egyptian Foreign Minister Sami Shukri at the opening of the U.S.-Egypt Strategic Dialogue, the first bilateral dialogue held since 2015. The Secretary and the Foreign Minister welcomed the opportunity to deepen the strong partnership between the United States and Egypt. I assume many of you uh, heard their comments and saw their comments earlier today. In addition to individuals from the Department of State, uh, U.S. participants in the dialogue include those from USAID, Department of Defense, and senior Egyptian officials representing different cabinet ministries. The dialogue provides a valuable opportunity to exchange views on key regional security issues. That includes developments in Sudan, Libya, Syria, and the broader region as well. U.S. and Egyptian officials will discuss ongoing efforts to restore the civilian-led transitional government and prevent violence in Sudan. Sudan. We also will have conversation on human rights. President Biden has committed to putting human rights at the center of our foreign policy, and we look forward to a constructive discussion on that front, including on civil and political rights, freedom of expression, and Egypt's recently announced national human rights strategy. We also discussed President, uh, President Biden's support for increased economic cooperation in Egypt's water security, uh, which was reaffirmed by Secretary Blinken when he met with President Sisi earlier this year in Cairo, uh, and our efforts to encourage negotiations between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan regarding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Our interagency team and, and Egyptian delegation will together explore ways to deepen bilateral cooperation on judicial, security, educational, and cultural issues. This strategic dialogue is an opportunity to advance each of these areas of collaboration to improve the lives of both Americans and Egyptians. And with all that said, I am happy to well, turn to your questions. It. That's it. Oh, we I was saved, a, like, saved a minute or two for I, questions. I, I was <laughs> expecting another hour or so. It's busy times. Um, uh, uh, let me, uh, I have a couple things, but I'll make them extremely brief and, 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 and won't get too much into detail. One, on your opening on Belarus, is th there isn't anything new, though, in terms of um, sanctions or actions that, you, that you're taking uh, today. Uh, is there? Is we're there not. We're not announcing any new actions uh, today, as you know, Matt. We have uh, announced a series of policy steps um, that, in some cases, yep. we have taken together with our partners uh, and our allies uh, in Europe as well. Okay. Uh, secondly, and I am not expecting much on this, but did, uh, you, you have seen obviously you've seen these reports about uh, coming from um, uh, I don't know what you were cyber investigators that. that um, NSO, the Israeli company NSO, had hacked uh, some of the, the phones of, the Palestinian, of, of members of the Palestinian NGOs that were designated as terrorist groups. Uh, I'm wondering what you make of, uh, of those allegations. I've seen those reports. I, I don't have a response to them. What I can tell you uh, is to reiterate that we had uh, a constructive discussion uh, with an Israeli delegation that was visiting last week. Uh, the delegation provided a verbal briefing uh, on uh, information uh, that they had on certain groups. Uh, they also provided written materials. We provided those written materials to uh, our counterparts uh, in the administration. We're going to take a very close look at them uh, as right. we. But you uh, haven't. You but you haven't yet reached any kind of conclusion based on the information that's provided, and you don't have anything, or do you, to say about these allegations? We the intend. We allegations. intend, and we are together with our partners throughout the interagency. Uh, to take a very close look uh, at the information that was provided to us in written form, to cross-reference that 
uh, information with uh, what we may have in our own holdings, uh, and from that we'll form uh, yeah. an, an informed judgment. And then lastly, on, on the Egypt, in his discussions with uh, former Minister Shukri, did the Secretary uh, raise specific um, cases, that you, uh, human rights cases, that you guys are concerned about, and um, uh, did he provide a, I don't know, a roadmap, for lack of a better word, for what, what the, the Egyptians must do or need to do to get the 130 million that's been withheld, restored? Uh, well, the uh, human rights discussion is actually ongoing right now. I believe it started at 145 or perhaps uh, just a little bit uh, thereafter. Uh, so I don't have a readout to provide. We may have some additional, uh, uh, that, that clock is an hour fast. We, uh, yeah. we need to, uh, we need to correct that. Um, obviously is not accounted for uh, uh, falling back here. Uh, but I would expect that the human rights discussion um, will have some specificity attached to it, and if we have more details to read out, we will. But, 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 but uh, in terms of the, the, the withheld, the money that's being withheld, well, do they get into details about what, 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 what must be done to... So, Matt, as we, as we uh, discussed, uh, I believe it was in September, uh, when we talked about the FMF decision, uh, we have conveyed to Egypt's leaders specific steps uh, we've urged them to take. We've made... Um, which, which are? <laughs> uh, of course, these steps are uh, conveyed privately, um, but also very clearly, uh, and we will leave them to those private discussions. Uh, sure. Uh, our, uh, in the Secretary's remarks with, uh, with Mr. Shukri, heard a lot of efforts to kind of move forward to talk about economic ties, to talk about security ties in the region. And uh, Secretary Blinken seemed to say that, you know, he appreciated Egypt's human rights uh, blueprint that they'd put forward. So is that is that the correct understanding? You know, are the two countries moving forward in their relations despite the previous hang-up of the, of the human rights issue? Well, our relationship with Egypt is a multifaceted one. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt is a valuable partner across many fronts. Uh, that is why the strategic dialogue that uh, is uh, occurring both today and tomorrow uh, will cover a, a broad range of issues. Uh, we've talked about, and they will talk about, uh, regional security issues. They will talk about uh, specific um, uh, uh, countries and developments of concern uh, in Sudan, in Ethiopia. Uh, as you mentioned, they will talk about our economic ties. They will talk about energy issues though, as well. Uh, they'll talk about uh, issues like artifacts um, uh, is also on the agenda. But yes, uh, human rights is certainly on the agenda. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, the human rights discussion is uh, ongoing uh, right now. Uh, human rights has always been uh, on the table when we've met uh, with our uh, Egyptian counterparts. When we went to Cairo, uh, Secretary Blinken had a conversation uh, with President Sisi uh, on this very topic. Every time he has spoken uh, with his Egyptian counterpart, Foreign Minister Shukri, uh, he has also raised uh, human rights. Uh, so we have made very clear uh, to the Egyptians our concerns. Uh, we have also welcomed certain steps they have taken, including uh, this human rights strategy that, that you referred to. We will continue uh, to make clear uh, where we find our areas of concern to be, uh, and we will continue to welcome uh, progress that we see going forward. Yes. sense that, that he's making progress there and also is he having any engagement with the, the TPLF or the uh, Oromo Liberation Army or you're not talking to them? Sure. Um, to your question, uh, the, the temporal reference is important. I think the last time we were in this room, uh, Special Envoy Feltman was in Ethiopia. He has since uh, left Ethiopia to return. Uh, let me come back to that and unpack that a little bit. Before I do, uh, let me just uh, reiterate that we remain fully engaged in efforts to move all sides uh, uh, towards an immediate cessation of hostilities. Uh, all of those in need, regardless of ethnicity, should have immediate access to life-saving humanitarian assistance. We call for an immediate end to human rights abuses and violations being committed um, uh, against civilians. Our embassy, uh, embassy in Addis Ababa uh, remains open under the leadership of our ambassador. Uh, Special Envoy Feltman does remain in the region where he is uh, working to further our diplomatic efforts. 
and we urge all parties to end restraint, uh, to use restraint, excuse me, to end hostilities, to respect human rights, and to prevent, uh, protect civilians uh, on the path towards an immediate cessation of hostilities. Um, let me make a couple other uh, points before I talk about our diplomacy. As you know, our embassy went to uh, ordered departure um, uh, recently. We are urging U.S. citizens in Ethiopia to depart the country using commercially available options. Uh, we've been saying this for several days now. Uh, we understand that commercial options remain available uh, in Addis. The embassy is in a position uh, to help the American citizen community in Ethiopia um, secure uh, their departure from uh, the country. We understand there is adequate uh, space available, capacity available on these flights. Um, and in the past several days, there have been more than a dozen flights uh, leaving uh, the airport uh, in Addis. We are providing a range of services to the American citizen community in Addis. We are prioritizing that even as we have gone on order departure to reduce our footprint um, from our uh, embassy in Addis. Uh, we, importantly, can even provide a repat repatriation loan uh, for U.S. citizens who cannot afford uh, at this time to purchase a U.S. Uh, commercial, uh, commercial ticket to the United States, uh, U.S. citizens uh, in Ethiopia who are interested in pursuing these options, and we encourage the, all of them to do so, uh, should contact the embassy. There is an email address available uh, on the embassy uh, website. Uh, we are, as I said, um, engaged in concerted diplomacy to, in, to urge all parties to end the hostilities immediately. Uh, we have called on uh, the Ethiopian government and the TPLF and the OLA uh, to enter into negotiations without preconditions towards a sustainable cessation of hostilities and for Eritrean forces uh, to withdraw immediately and permanently uh, from Ethiopia. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, Ambassador Feltman's activity in the region, uh, he returned to Ethiopia today from Kenya, and I'll come to that, um, to continue to urgently press the parties to de-escalate the conflict and negotiate, as I said before, a cessation of hostilities. He continues to raise our concern about the risk of intercommunal violence, and that is a concern that we've raised uh, repeatedly uh, with Ethiopian authorities and regional authorities in recent days. Um, but following his meeting, uh, meetings on his current trip, uh, we believe there is a small window of opening to work with the AU High Representative for the Horn of Africa, former President of Sancho, uh, whom he will see again tonight uh, in Addis, uh, where uh, Ambassador Feltman has returned, to further joint efforts to peacefully resolve the conflict in Ethiopia. Uh, we are working with international partners to address the crisis in Ethiopia, including through action with the UN, the AU, uh, and other uh, relevant partners and bodies. Uh, you all may have seen some of the statements that have emanated from uh, the region in, in uh, recent days and recent hours. Uh, of course, the UN Security Council, which will, help, which will hold an open session on Ethiopia today, uh, released a statement. Uh, and as Ambassador Thomas Greenfield said, the council uh, spoke with one voice, uh, calling for an end to the violence uh, and a cessation of hostilities. You may also have seen uh, that President Kenyatta, uh, with whom uh, Ambassador Feltman has uh, met in Nairobi in recent days, uh, issued uh, a similar statement, uh, calling for dialogue and urging uh, a few points. President Kenyatta um, made many of the same points that we have been making. All hostilities uh, must cease. Uh, political solution uh, is the only solution. Uh, there should be no incitement, uh, no incitement uh, to violence. And said, instead, uh, we must work to de-escalate tensions and hostilities. Uh, he noted the fact that we must address the humanitarian situation with some urgency, uh, and the parties to the conflict must allow humanitarian access, uh, which has been uh, restricted uh, for many of those in need for far too long. Uh, and of course, the imperative of respecting uh, human rights um, for all and by all. Uh, and so uh, the actors, the uh, forces in Ethiopia have heard a consistent message emanating from the United States. Uh, emanating from other countries in the region, emanating from uh, the UN Security Council. Uh, of course, the conflict in Ethiopia uh, predates this uh, administration. We, unfortunately, it was last week that we marked a somber milestone. Uh, one full year of violence in Tigray. Uh, and since the earliest days of this administration, uh, President Biden, Secretary Blinken, uh, have prioritized uh, our diplomacy uh, to uh, find a way out uh, of this violence. Uh, it has involved uh, not only the Special Envoy, 
uh, but uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, in his repeated engagements, uh, the National Security Advisor, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Wendy Sherman, Assistant Secretary Fee, all of them uh, have been uh, very much engaged in this. Um, we, have hold, we have held, uh, and Special Envoy Feltman, uh, in his seven or so months uh, on the job, uh, have held over, uh, has held over 300 engagements uh, with the AU, with the UN, with the EU, uh, with regional uh, neighbors uh, as well. This diplomacy has been concerted. It has uh, been intense. If you just look at the schedule uh, that Ambassador Feltman um, uh, has maintained over the past few days, where he has shuttled back and forth uh, between Ethiopia and Kenya, as I mentioned before, uh, as of today, he is now back in Ethiopia. He is back in, in Addis. Uh, we will have more to read out uh, when uh, his trip concludes, or um, at least uh, uh, this chapter of his trip uh, concludes. Uh, as we've made clear uh, last week on November 4th, uh, he met uh, in Ethiopia with a number of Ethiopian uh, officials uh, and regional officials. Uh, he met with African Union Commission Chairperson Musa Faki. Uh, he met with Ethiopian Minister of Defense Belay, Minister of Finance uh, Ahmed Shide, uh, Deputy Prime Minister um, uh, Hassan. Uh, he met with Prime Minister Abe the, uh, the following day on November 5th. Uh, and uh, over the weekend, uh, he met with President Kenyatta uh, in Nairobi to consult on uh, Ethiopia. Uh, as we've said, we certainly value the leadership that President Kenyatta has demonstrated, uh, and we appreciate the constructive visit uh, that Special Envoy Feltman um, had to uh, Nairobi from where he has uh, just traveled uh, back to Addis. When it comes to t the TPLF, um, we have engaged with uh, the TPLF as well. Uh, we are engaging uh, with the parties uh, to try and uh, put them on a, on a path uh, to a cessation of hostilities, uh, which is our uh, priority now and going forward. Yeah, you can that say that your one. diplomacy has been concerted and intense, but can you say it's been successful? Uh, Matt, there, or Sudan, or Lebanon, or Yemen? Matt, it is... Can you... Can you, can you I, I'm not one to blame the U.S. for all the world. For, Ill, for, but but for you're the one who's just come out and given a five-minute list of all the meetings that have been going on. And has the situation gotten better or worse well, since I, this administration took office I, and began I, 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 this intense diplomacy? I was just asking where he was now. That's right. <laughs> exactly. I, 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 you know, it wasn't the question. You decided to do it. So has it been successful? I, I, I was asked about his activities, Fair so enough. I thought it was prudent to and, and answer has, the question and, and, and talk about has the administration's concerted and intense diplomacy? Ha has, Any, has, 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 has this administration's concerted diplomacy solved a problem that predates this administration? No, it, uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, it, it absolutely does matter. It, Matt, no, what, it matters. I mean, Matt, you've been in office what, for eight what, months, and you're what talking matters, about how important this what is matters, and how much what, effort and time what and matters, money Matt. you put into it. And I just want to know, can you say that it's successful or not? Uh, what matters, Matt, uh, is that we have been engaged on this. We, uh, as I said before, see a window of opportunity here. Um, the United States is engaged. We are working uh, with uh, Ethiopian authorities as well as with the countries in the region. Uh, why don't we uh, come back to this uh, sure. in the coming days when uh, this diplomacy will have been ongoing uh, and we can point uh, okay. to uh, progress. Uh, it is not in the DNA of this administration to sit on the sidelines, uh, or worse, uh, to uh, take actions or uh, engage in rhetoric that uh, may only inflame tensions. Uh, so it is very much in our DNA uh, to be engaged, to be engaged constructively, uh, to work with our international partners, uh, to try and put an end to the suffering, to the violence, uh, to the humanitarian uh, emergency that has afflicted the people of Tigray and, uh, and, and other regions of Ethiopia. Andrew. When you talk about Iraq and the assassination attempt, um, what are your initial findings in terms of who may have been responsible? There's an obvious, uh, an obvious neighbor that had sponsored militia attacks before and how that might affect other diplomatic. Well, when it comes. Will there be another U.S. response? Will there be a U.S. response? When it comes to uh, the culpability, uh, there is an Iraqi investigation that's underway. Uh, we are going to uh, defer to uh, the Iraqis for uh, the progress of that investigation. Uh, we have made very clear, Secretary Blinken has made very clear, President Biden 
uh, has made very clear in his statements that the United States stands ready to assist in any and every way we can uh, with the Iraqi investigation should they uh, request our assistance. But uh, broadly, uh, and to, to come back to your question, uh, we are outraged uh, and we strongly condemn uh, the attack on Iraq's Prime Minister. Uh, he, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Khatami, represents not only uh, the head of government, but he represents the state of Iraq. Uh, and he is the commander in chief of Iraq's security forces. Uh, and therefore, we believe that this was an attack not only on him, uh, but also on the sovereignty and stability of the Iraqi state. As I said before, the president has issued a very clear instruction to his national security team uh, that we are to provide every form uh, of appropriate assistance uh, that our Iraqi partners uh, may need in this. As you know, Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to speak yesterday with Prime Minister Khatami. Uh, he uh, reiterated the same message. He condemned uh, the attack. He noted his relief uh, that the Prime Minister was uh, unharmed uh, in this. Uh, and he also underscored the importance we place on uh, our partnership with the government of Iraq uh, and pledge to support the Iraqi security forces as they investigate this. Well, if it, I mean, how can the United States, after pouring you know, decades of support for a legitimate government and, and legitimate elections in Iraq, how can the United States stand back and not take some kind of action if you find and if the Iraqis find who might be responsible? I didn't say we would. Uh, I said we are going to defer to the Iraqi investigation, which is ongoing. Uh, as you know, uh, we reserve the right uh, in coordination with our partners, uh, in this case, uh, the government of Iraq. Uh, to respond uh, to aggression at a time and place and with the means of our choosing. Uh, but again, before we uh, speak about a response, uh, we will let the Iraqi investigation proceed. Uh, we will continue to consult closely with our Iraqi partners if they determine that they have any needs, that their own capacities and capabilities uh, uh, leave unmet. Uh, we are happy to provide that assistance uh, and together uh, we will uh, uh, chart uh, the next steps. One more thing. If it does turn out that Iran is responsible, would this impact other other negotiations or other tracks with, with Iran? Uh, again, I'm not going to engage in a hypothetical uh, about uh, who may or may not be responsible. Um, you are correct that we've seen a number of attacks uh, that have been, uh, that have had links uh, to Iran-backed groups, um, but when it comes to uh, this attack, we're going to let the investigation uh, play out. Please. Um, so regarding the U.S. Assistant Secretary Crittenberg's uh, calling travel to Seoul, there's some reporting that he will be meeting with South Korean presidential um, candidates. Is that true? Uh, we issued a, a media note on this. As you know, uh, so Assistant Secretary Crittenberg is in Seoul right now. Uh, he is meeting with uh, government counterparts. Uh, he will then travel to Tokyo, um, where he also will meet uh, with counterparts. We'll have readouts of those engagements, uh, I suspect, when his travel ends. Um, and what is the um, secretary's planning, uh, um, if the secretary's planning to discuss the Korean, with the Korean, Korean government during his visit? Are there any topics um, that you know of, and will the end of war declaration be on table? Uh, well, I would uh, suspect that uh, the threat that is posed by the DPRK's uh, missile and ballistic, uh, uh, ballistic missile and, and, nu and uh, nuclear program uh, will uh, certainly be on the table, as will uh, our uh, strategy uh, to advance the prospects for the complete and total denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula um, will uh, also be a topic of discussion as well. Um, but our relationship uh, with the ROK, our treaty ally, uh, is broad uh, and it's deep, so that there, there will be a number uh, of issues that uh, they discuss together. Just a follow-up question on that. Um, Mr. Sullivan um, said that the U.S. and Korea have different perspectives on the end of war declaration. Will there be dialogue to narrow the difference during his visit? Uh, we see eye to eye uh, with our South Korean counterparts uh, that um, achieving a complete denuclearization uh, and lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula uh, through dialogue and diplomacy uh, is uh, the best and the most effective course. Um, we will continue to seek engagement uh, with the DPRK uh, as part of what we've called a calibrated and practical approach in order to make tangible progress uh, that increases the security not only for the United States, uh, but also for our regional allies. And of course, that includes the ROK uh, and Japan as well. 
Yes. Uh, when it comes to Ambassador Feltman's travel um, uh, and his current stay in, in Addis, um, we'll update you uh, as we're able with, uh, with additional meetings. As I mentioned, uh, he is meeting with uh, the AU's representative for uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, uh, former President Obasanjo, uh, uh, today. Um, but we will update you as uh, additional meetings um, uh, come into the, uh, are confirmed. Uh, we have seen reports uh, that uh, those with Tigrayan uh, ethnicity are coming under, um, uh, are being harassed or, or worst. Uh, of course, those reports um, are uh, concerning. It is part of the reason why uh, we have called for an immediate cessation uh, of hostilities, um, knowing that the potential for intercommunal violence uh, remains high. Uh, we are uh, deeply concerned uh, about the potential for uh, escalating intercommunal violence. Uh, it is why uh, we are engaged uh, with a number of actors, a number of uh, officials um, in the Ethiopian, Ethiopian government, why we have engaged with the TPLF, uh, why we are working at this um, very concertedly. Yes. Um, Dean, I have two, a few follow-ups, first on Iraq and then on Egypt and Sudan. On Iraq, uh, many experts believe that this attack or attempted assassination on the prime minister's life has a modus operandi of the pro-Iran militias. Do you believe, does the State Department believe that uh, these militias can work independently and operate independently without a green light from Tehran? Uh, again, um, I don't want to get ahead of the Iraqi investigation. Uh, what is true is that we have seen uh, a number of uh, aggressive actions uh, conducted by Iran-backed groups uh, including in uh, Iraq, uh, but when it comes to this uh, attack, I wouldn't want to characterize uh, where the investigation, what the investigation has uncovered yet, uh, or what it may uncover uh, in the days to come. We will stay in close touch with our Iraqi partners yes, on so that. You can confirm that they use drones, and the only militias that have drones are the ones who are trained and um, supplied by Iran. Uh, certainly everything uh, that I have seen speaks to uh, the use of uh, a drone. Uh, we have also expressed our concerns uh, with the proliferation of drone technology, some of it Iranian UAV uh, capabilities uh, in, in the region. Again, without speaking to what happened over the weekend, uh, this has been uh, a, a persistent, um, uh, a prominent concern of ours. Uh, as you know, it was just a se several days ago uh, that we announced uh, uh, additional um, policy tools uh, to um, pursue those who have been responsible for proliferating some of this uh, UAV technology uh, in the region, some of which is of Iranian origin. On Egypt, you said that um, one of the topics of discussion is regional security. Sudan is one of them. Um, do you see uh, the, the Egyptian position identical to the U.S.? Where do you differ? Where do you agree? And why we didn't see Egypt on the signatory of the Quad uh, statement that you issued last year? So I, I will leave it to Cairo to explain their uh, position on Sudan. What I will say is that uh, regional security uh, and specific uh, and developments in certain countries will be on the agenda, and that includes uh, what has transpired in Sudan on October 25th and the days since. Um, they will, Secretary Blinken and uh, his Egyptian counterpart, uh, will discuss uh, ongoing efforts to restore the civilian-led transitional government and to prevent violence in Sudan. Uh, a lot has been made of the, uh, the Quad statement uh, that was issued last week. It was an important statement uh, because it did carry the signatures of the United States, of the United, King United Kingdom, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, and the United Arab Emirates, uh, calling for a restoration of the, civi the civilian-led transitional uh, government. Uh, the Quad for Sudan uh, is, as, you, uh, as the name would suggest, a collection of four countries uh, in, the, in the Sudanese context. Yeah, uh, it could be five or six, even. On Sudan. Well, there was no quad on Sudan it, before. Th there, there, there you was guys a, just invented it. It could have been a septet. <laughs> there was a quad for Sudan octet. statement last week and a very powerful one at that. Yeah. Well, uh, had the quad on Sudan ever issued a statement before? I would have to go back and look. Okay, so. just two words to pull up as well. Before. So it could have been a quint. Go ahead. And, and, and an assistant to the Secretary General of the Arab League said that um, a solution to the crisis in Sudan is imminent. Are you aware of any development that could indicate, actually, that could be ending the crisis soon? 
Look, we, as I uh, have said already uh, in the context of uh, Ethiopia, but uh, Ambassador Feltman and the team here, including Secretary Blinken, who's had engagements uh, both with uh, Prime Minister Hamdak uh, and General Burhan in recent days, uh, we are working uh, to uh, see a, um, a resolution to this. And in our minds, there is only one resolution, one appropriate resolution, and that is the restoration uh, of the civilian-led transitional government. Um, uh, so we are working on that. Uh, we are doing that across multiple uh, diplomatic fronts and through multiple uh, diplomatic channels. Uh, I think it's best not to characterize uh, the progress there. Um, but again, uh, in our mind, there is only one appropriate resolution to this, and that's the restoration of the civilian well, well, Sorry, one last question. I don't get the chance to ask you a question. Of course. Of course. <laughs> so one last question on uh, Egypt and Ethiopia as well. You said one of the discussions was about the dam which was a, a sticking point between the three countries. Two of them now are going through con strife or turmoil or civil war, if you want. So what's going to happen to that, considering the, what's happening in Ethiopia and in Sudan? Does this uh, adversely affect this negotiation, obviously? It, and it, you worry about it. That might go completely out of hand. Well, developments vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the GERD um, uh, and developments in these countries uh, won't affect uh, the bottom line, uh, and that is that uh, we will continue to support a collaborative uh, and uh, constructive efforts um, by these three countries to reach an enduring arrangement uh, on the dam. Obviously, this is uh, an issue that is of high importance to all three countries, uh, given their uh, reliance on the Nile River waters, uh, and will continue uh, to engage, uh, uh, engage with these countries to find a solution that's acceptable uh, to the three of them. Yes. I had a question on Myanmar. Um, President Trump was case last week uh, came up in court and he was denied bail um, and a new charge was brought against him. Um, that coincided with the trip of Governor Richardson um, to Myanmar and he's uh, subsequently told press that the State Department told him not to raise Spencer's case with the Burmese government you know, in, the, in these meetings that he had. Um, I'm wondering, you know, you know, why would you ask him not to not to raise that? And, you know, do you not think that uh, Governor Richardson would have could have some impact on the case where you guys, you know, your diplomacy so far hasn't been able to, to get him through? Well, I wouldn't want to characterize any private discussions that were had with Governor Richardson. As you know, uh, he traveled to Burma not as an emissary, not as a representative of the United States government, uh, but as a uh, private citizen. Uh, this is an effort, this was an effort uh, that was not uh, sponsored by or on behalf of uh, the United States government. Now, of course, uh, we hope that his trip uh, over the longer term does contribute to uh, improved humanitarian access. Uh, that, of course, is in uh, our interest. It's in everyone's uh, interest as well. Uh, when it comes to the case of uh, Danny Fenster, um, look, we have made uh, very clear uh, where we stand on this. Uh, we uh, remain deeply concerned uh, over his continued uh, de detention. Um, we uh, recognize it as just another sad reminder of the continuing human rights and uh, humanitarian crisis uh, facing the country. We do so today on the one-year anniversary of the Burmese elections um, that uh, indica indicated a degree of promise that the military junta uh, has attempted to uh, extinguish, uh, even though the people of Burma have made clear that their democratic aspirations, uh, their uh, demands for uh, human rights and basic free freedoms uh, will not uh, be extinguished. Um, we have continued to press the junta uh, for uh, Danny's release. Uh, we will do that until he is able to uh, return home uh, to his family. Uh, consular officers have routinely uh, met and, and have spoken with uh, Danny. They last did so uh, by phone late last month on October 31st. Uh, this case is uh, an absolute priority uh, for uh, the department and it will be until Danny is able to return to his family. Yes.
you think that this is an, an approach that you can support the no Burhan, no Hamdouk for the future? Uh, again, um, our bottom line is in the bottom line of the international community. Uh, and we have heard uh, a number of countries, a number of international institutions, a number of international bodies uh, speak with uh, one voice on that. Uh, and that is that there needs to be a restoration of the civilian-led transitional government. Uh, there needs to be a restoration of what it is that uh, the military uh, sought to topple. Uh, this is, um, uh, these are, uh, what is most important is that these are not um, our objectives. Uh, these are the aspirations of the Sudanese people. Uh, we have seen the Sudanese people uh, take to the streets to march peacefully throughout Khartoum uh, and other uh, cities and towns across Sudan. Millions uh, of Sudanese uh, have done so. Uh, and they have done so uh, to clearly uh, underscore where it is uh, that, um, and what it is that they feel uh, needs to happen. Uh, there's no ambiguity about what the people of Sudan want, uh, and there should be no ambiguity about where the United States uh, and where our uh, allies and partners stand on this as well. Can I just follow up on that real quickly? Because the Secretary said that the U.S. shared that interest with the Egyptians, mm -hmm. but there are reports that the Egyptians uh, supported um, this take of military takeover. So can you square that? Uh, what the Secretary said in his uh, opening remarks and, and is what's, what I said in the topper as well, is that we will discuss uh, with our Egyptian partners uh, the need to restore uh, the civilian-led transitional government in Sudan. Again, I'm going to allow the Egyptians uh, to uh, characterize the nuance of, of their position, um, but certainly this will be a topic of discussion uh, with our Egyptian counterparts. There is a, um, uh, there is a widespread uh, shared consensus uh, that uh, the civilian-led transitional government in Sudan uh, needs to be restored, restored and needs to be restored immediately. Jane. have any comment and when was the last time embassy officials were granted access to him? Uh, so I've uh, seen those reports, uh, but due to privacy considerations, I'm not uh, in a position to uh, uh, comment on them. Uh, when it comes to uh, Trevor Reed, Ambassador Sullivan last visited uh, Trevor Reed on September 22nd. Uh, we are continuing to seek contact with Trevor as we monitor his uh, case closely. I suspect uh, that the ambassador will have another opportunity to visit Trevor and, of course, Paul Whelan uh, uh, going forward. Yes. Uh, it, we have made very clear uh, where it is that uh, we stand um, when it comes to coal uh, and when it comes to uh, our uh, use of coal um, domestically and around the world. Uh, I think the important point is that statements uh, are declarations uh, and they are important, uh, but they can't be seen as an end in and of themselves. They have to be backed up by action. Uh, and we are and have been moving forward on a just energy transition. Uh, in fact, uh, President Biden's first specific climate pledge uh, was decarbonizing the U.S. energy supply by 2035. Uh, so no one should underestimate uh, how serious we are. No one should underestimate uh, the um, ways in which uh, we, not have we have not only raised our own climate ambition with our uh, own uh, ambitious targets, but also uh, the ways in which we've galvanized uh, actions by countries around the world uh, to seek to meet uh, the needs of this decisive decade. Um, if we are to uh, uh, arrive at, um, okay. no problem. Uh, if we are to arrive at a, me a means by which uh, to prevent global warming, warming from not exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark. But as the third largest user of coal, I mean, wouldn't it help to galvanize some more action if, if the U.S. did sign on to this pledge? And regardless of the pledge, are you are you uh, willing to say whether or not the administration thinks it can phase out coal by a, a certain date? Uh, well, we have uh, pushed in a number of ways uh, to um, transition away um, from some of the most harmful uh, emitters of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, uh, when it comes to coal, uh, we pushed for and won an agreement at the G7 last summer to support a, quote, transition away from unabated coal capacity uh, and to achieve an overwhelmingly decarbonized power system in the 2030s. Um, we did push hard uh, for uh, language like that at the G20 uh, last week, or the other week, I should say, 
um, and will continue to do so. Uh, again, we have been very clear uh, in terms of where we stand uh, on our own uh, climate targets, on our own climate ambitions, uh, and that includes uh, with regards to coal. Yes. Hey, uh, Jake, Jake Sullivan said that the circumstances had changed in, in the island. Uh, what does he mean? Is the U.S. mulling new sanctions? Is anything else to sanction? Uh, well, I think what uh, the National Security, Security Advisor was referring to is that events uh, in Cuba, uh, certainly the events of July 11th, the events uh, subsequent to uh, July 11th, uh, they have weighed heavily on our approach. And we have uh, not been shy in speaking about uh, and calling out uh, the human rights abuses, the repression, uh, the um, uh, arbitrary detentions that have taken place uh, in Cuba uh, since uh, July 11th. And our policy, um, both before J July 11th and, and certainly since, uh, has focused on support for the Cuban people and accountability for the Cuban officials who have been responsible uh, for some of the human rights abuses that we have seen. Um, we are, the world is expecting um, protests uh, in the coming days as well, uh, as the Cuban people have made clear that they will once again peacefully um, march in the streets to uh, make clear their aspirations for uh, democracy, uh, human rights, uh, civil, liberty, civil liberties, and, and political rights. Um, we have uh, centered our efforts uh, in Cuba, when it comes to Cuba, on this question of the rights of the Cuban people uh, and steps that we can take to advance the cause of democracy on the island. Uh, and we have sought in doing so to impose tangible and significant consequences in connection with the abuses that uh, I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, we are prepared to continue doing so um, should the repression, should the human rights abuses, uh, should, the, um, uh, should the abuses of uh, the Cuban regime uh, not, uh, not cease. Now, my question to you is how likely do you think that Chris Triffis in his new formal position, and that, if I am, can you give us any details about that? That is correct. So Tom West uh, is currently in uh, Brussels. Uh, he um, had an opportunity to uh, meet with the NAC uh, in Brussels. Uh, he also engaged in a, in a press call earlier this morning. Oh, he did. Uh, okay. He did, uh, and he provided some some detail on his travel. Um, then, he, then we don't need. To I'll just it. very quickly make make the point that uh, he will go to London as well. He will go to, to Pakistan, to Russia, uh, to India. Um, together with our partners, he will continue uh, to um, uh, make clear the expectations that we have of the Taliban and of any future uh, Afghan yeah, government. But he's not going to Afghanistan. Uh, there are no plans and to do that. Uh, he did not speak to plans to go to Doha today, um, but he's going to London uh, as well as to pa Thank Pakistan, you. Russia, and India. Can I quickly ask about Haiti? Is there any update on the um, hostage missionaries there? Uh, Reuters reported on Friday that the U.S. had seen proof of life for some of them. Can you confirm that report? Uh, I'm not in a position to confirm that, and I'm not in a position to confirm that chiefly because uh, the resolution of these cases uh, oftentimes relies uh, on um, uh, this activity taking place. Uh, out of public sight, out of public view, uh, and that is exactly uh, the way we've been uh, engaging uh, with the organization, the missionary organization at the center um, uh, of this. It's how we've been engaging with uh, our Haitian counterparts, including the Haitian National Police, uh, the most senior uh, Haitian authorities uh, as well, including with uh, the Canadian government, uh, given that one of the hostages is a Canadian citizen. So uh, our embassy in Port-au-Prince, uh, our uh, senior officials here uh, have continued uh, to um, uh, be very focused on this, uh, but I just don't have an update to offer publicly. Okay, thank you all very much.